This is going to be Genesis chapter 25. So Genesis 25 and verse 1. Then again, Abraham took a wife and her name was Keturah. So this is after the death of Sarah. Abraham takes another wife and he has even more children. And we see in verse 2, it says, And she bare him Zimran and Jokshan and Medan and Midian and Ishbak and Shua. So you see that like Midian, Midian as in Midianites that Gideon and Israel go up against in the book of Judges. And look, read Judges 6 and look at verse 6 and 7. And you'll see that, you know, Abraham, he keeps taking these wives like he got with Hagar, who came from Hagar, Ishmael. Uh, they end up being enemies of the Jews, the people that came from him. Uh, the people that are going to come from uh, these guys, they're going to be enemies to the Jews. So it, he's just producing more enemies later on down the road. Marrying Keturah did the same thing as marrying Hagar. So he has all these boys, and Jokshan begat Sheba and Dedan, and the sons of Dedan were Ashuram and Latushim and Leumim and the sons of Midian, Ephah and Epher and Hanak and Abida and Elda, all these were the children of Keturah. And Abraham gave, gave all that he had unto Isaac. Notice that. And Abraham gave all that he had unto Isaac. And remember that Isaac is a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. So just like Abraham gives all that he had unto Isaac, the Father gives all that he has to the Lord Jesus Christ. In John 3.35 it says, The Father loveth the Son, and hath given all things into his hands. So there's a lot of similarities. If you look at the relationship and the stories about Abraham and Isaac, you're going to see so, sim so many similarities between him, between those two guys and the Father and the Son. Genesis 25, 5 and 6, And Abraham gave all that he had unto Isaac. But unto the sons of the concubines, which Abraham had, Abraham gave gifts and sent them away from Isaac his son, while he yet lived eastward unto the east country. So notice that Abraham wanted Isaac separated from these guys. It says he sent them guys away, just like he sent out Ishmael and Hagar. Uh, none of Keturah's sons could stay with uh, Isaac, and none of them could would have any part in the inheritance. Genesis 25, 7, And these are the days of the years of Abraham's life which he lived, and hundred threescore and fifteen years. And that's 175 years. So you see a decrease in the age. You remember back uh, Noah, Adam, Methuselah, all living over 900 years old. The ages are declining over time after the flood. Abraham lives to be 175. You're going to see in Exodus, Moses lived to be 120. And then where we're at now, people's living to be usually 70 to 80. So, but Abraham, he lived to be 175. Sarah died at 127. But it says in verse 8, Then Abraham gave up the ghosts and died in a good old age, an old man and full of years, and was gathered to his people. Notice he is full of years. Right now, if you're young, you probably aren't ready to die yet. But there's going to come a time for most people that they are ready to die. And they are full of years. Just like when you eat food, uh, you get full. You get satisfied with off of what you've ate and you don't want any more. A lot of people, they live a good, long life. They get full of years and they've lived long enough to be satisfied. And that's how you see people who say, I'm, I'm ready to go. I'm just ready to go. And they genuinely mean that they're ready to go. So I'm sure you've heard someone say that in your life. I'm ready to just get out of this world. I mean, there's a sense that all Christians want to leave this world there's to take it even further there's going to be a time when you really get full of years you're really ready to go so abraham died in a good old age an old man and full of years and was gathered to his people 
His soul went down to paradise that was in the heart of the earth at the time, and this is the place uh, the beggar Lazarus went in Luke 16. Remember in Luke 16, Jesus describes how the rich man in hell, he's over there in hell, but he could still see Abraham and Lazarus over there on the other side. And on one side, there's comfort. On another side, there's torment. And the rich man even begged for Lazarus to give him a drop of water on his tongue. So obviously there was water on one side, and then on one side there wasn't. And a lot of people are trying to make this out to be some type of fairy tale. But read Luke 16. And to, to get around it, they're saying it was a one-time thing. This was a one-time thing that the rich man was able to see up into the third heaven and see Abraham and Lazarus. I mean, you got to add that in there. I'm not seeing any of that. I'm seeing Abraham and Lazarus in the heart of the earth. The rich man's in the heart of the earth down there. I mean, he, he's in hell, and he looks over, and he can see them afar off. That's what I'm seeing. So I, I still believe, even after all the controversy against, you know, the Old Testament saints going to the heart of the earth at death, I still believe that uh, that's where they went at death was to the heart of the earth. I mean, they're not there now. But back then, that's where they went. And it says, Then Abraham gave up the ghost. So his soul left him, and he died in a good old age, and an, an old man, and full of years, and was gathered to his people. And his sons Isaac and Ishmael buried him in the cave Machpelah, in the field of Ephron, the son of Zohar the Hittite, which is before Mamre. So this shows you that his soul went somewhere before he was buried. And notice it said he was gathered to his people. So Abraham went to a place where his people were that had already died. And that would be his soul that went there. Not his body, but his soul. And then it says uh, they buried his body in verse 9. So that shows you the difference there. We all have a body. We've all got a soul. Everybody's body's going to the grave. But your soul, it's going to go to heaven or hell. If you're saved, the moment you close your eyes in death, you're going to be with the Lord. If you're lost, the moment you close your eyes in death, you're going to hell. The same place the rich man went in Luke 16. Remember, he said, he it says it, he lifted up his eyes being in torments. Now, Genesis 25, 10 and 11. The field which Abraham purchased of the sons of Heth, there was Abraham buried and Sarah his wife. And it came to pass after the death of Abraham that God blessed his son Isaac. And Isaac dwelt by the well, Lahiroi. So it's good to dwell by a well. Uh, are you dwelling by a well? Uh, I think a good illustration of that would be your Bible. You know, that's where you're getting your daily cleansing from are you daily cleansing in the word are you letting it soak through you and clean you out just like you would pour Drano down the drain and it clears out a bunch of gunk up in there you read the word and it gets all that gunk out of you are you dwelling by a well you know jesus christ is the living water uh, he he sanctifies and cleanses the church with the with the washing of water by the word it says in Psalms, Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to thy word. So you need a daily cleansing. You probably need a couple cleansing a, cleansings a day. So are you dwelling by a well? Isaac dwelt by the well, Lahiroi. And it says, Now these are the generations of Ishmael, Abraham's son, who made guard the Egyptian, Sarah's handmaid barren to Abraham, and these are the names of the sons of Ishmael, by their names, according to their generations. The firstborn of Ishmael, Nebajoth, and Kedar, and Adbil, and Mibsam, and Mishma, and Duma, and Mesa, and Hadar, and Tima, and Jeter, and Naphish, and Kadima. These are the sons of Ishmael, and these are their names, by their towns, and by their castles, twelve princes according to their nations. So you'll notice that people call towns by their names. It says these are their names by their towns and by their castles. 
people name towns after their own names. It says in Psalm 49, 11, their inward thought is that their houses shall continue forever and their dwelling places to all generations. They call their lands after their own names. Also notice that uh, Ishmael has 12 sons. It says 12 princes according to their nation. So he has 12 sons, just like Jacob is going to have 12 sons. Uh, Genesis twenty five seventeen, And these are the years of the life of Ishmael, 130 and 7 years. And he gave up the ghost and died and was gathered into his people. So he was 137 when he died. He gave up the ghost. His soul departed. And that's what happens when you die and you give up the ghost. Your soul leaves your body. At Genesis, Genesis thirty five eighteen says, And it came to pass as her soul was in departing, for she died. So when she died, her soul left her body. And it doesn't hang around here in hot houses. It doesn't hang around here and try to contact its loved ones and uh, get things straightened out. It goes to heaven or it goes to hell. Genesis twenty five eighteen through 20. And they dwelt from Havilah unto Shur, that is before Egypt, as thou goest toward Assyria, and he died in the presence of all his brethren. And these are the generations of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham begat Isaac. And Isaac was forty years old when he took Rebekah to wife, the daughter of Bethuel, the Syrian of Padan Aram, the sister to Laban, the Syrian. So Isaac was forty when he took a wife. There is no shame in being a forty-year-old virgin. Hollywood likes to make that look like a tragedy for someone to be a virgin who is over 15 years old. Uh, this is because they are a bunch of perverts, but it's not a bad thing to be a 40-year-old virgin. It's a great thing to be able to uh, stay a virgin until you get married and share that experience with your wife, and hopefully she can sh share that experience with you. It says in Genesis twenty five twenty one, And Isaac entreated the Lord for his wife, because she was barren, and the Lord was entreated of him, and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. So Isaac calls on the Lord because Rebekah was barren. She couldn't have children. And this prayer is in the will of God because Isaac is going to carry the promised seed. So the Lord answers the prayer, and Rebekah conceives. She's going to have twins, Jacob and Esau. And now we're going to see how Jacob and Esau are a type of the flesh versus the spirit. And this is a good study. So it says in Genesis 25, 22, And the children struggled within her. Right off we see it. You know, in, in your Christian life, your flesh is contrary to your spirit. The Bible even says that they are contrary to the one to the other you know they're constantly back and forth back and forth it says in galatians five sixteen, this i say then walk in the spirit and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh galatians five seventeen. for the flesh lusteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh and these are contrary the one to the other so that you cannot do the things that ye would so Right off, we see a similarity. Genesis twenty five twenty two, And the children struggled together within her. You got Jacob and Esau, a picture of the flesh and the spirit, struggling together within her. And she said, If it be so, why am I thus? And she went to inquire of the Lord. And the Lord said unto her, Two nations are in thy womb, and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels. Uh, your flesh and your spirit are like two different people. Your flesh is called the old man. What's in you is a new creature. They're two different people. It says, And two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels, and the one people shall be stronger than the other people, and the elder shall serve the younger. Uh, one of them is stronger than the other. The spirit is willing, the flesh is weak. The flesh is not strong. The spirit is strong. And it says the elder shall serve the younger. Esau will be the elder. He comes out first. And Jacob is the younger. He comes out last. But notice that this is... 
this is, uh, it shows you who serves who. Your, your spirit should be in charge. Your flesh should be serving the spirit. And if you think about it, just look at the phrase, the elder shall serve the younger. When it comes to your flesh versus your spirit, you've lived in your flesh longer than you have in your spirit. So in that sense, just in that sense, it is the elder. I mean, I was 21 years old when I got saved, and that was 21 years that I was living in the flesh without being in the spirit. After salvation, you still have the flesh. So in a, in the in the sense in the sense of how long you've had it compared compared to how long you've had the Holy Spirit, the flesh is the elder. Yeah, in the sense of how long you've had the flesh compared to how long you've had the Holy Spirit, you've had the flesh longer in that sense the flesh is the elder, just like Esau is the elder. So your goal should be to make the flesh, which is the elder, to serve the younger the spirit, the younger, the new creature in you. So your first birth, remember, your first birth, when you were born of your mother, the first birth was no good. Uh, it did nothing for you. You had to be born again. Your, when you got born again, that was your second birth. Your second birth, that's what got you in. And see, just like Esau came out first, he was the elder, he was no good. Jacob came out second. He's the one the promised seed would come through. And you see this pattern throughout the book of Genesis. You had Cain and Abel. Which one was better? The younger one, Abel. You had Isaac and Ishmael. Which one was better? Isaac, which was the second one. You have, your, you have Jacob and Esau. Which one turns out to be... Who the promised seed goes through? Jacob, the younger. Uh, your first birth and your second birth, which one was better? The second one. So you see the pattern all the way through. The second one's better. The second birth is better. Genesis 25, 24, and 25. And when her days to be delivered were for fulfilled, behold, there were twins in her womb. And the first came out red all over like a hairy garment, and they called his name Esau. So let's look at this Esau. Esau is a type of the Antichrist. Just like you got types of the Lord Jesus Christ, you also got a bunch of types of the Antichrist. So he's a type of the Antichrist, and he's a type of the flesh. So that's fitting. And it, he's also a picture of a worldly Christian. See, there's so many different ways that you can look at this. But what makes him a picture of the Antichrist? But, well, notice he's red. Well, that reminds us of somebody... Who else is read in Revelation 12, 3? It says, And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon. Uh, that would be the devil. Next, uh, he's hairy. You know, there's a lot of good characters that's hairy, but there's also some bad ones that just happen to be a type of the Antichrist. Nebuchadnezzar, a type of the Antichrist, in Daniel 4, 33 his hair grew so long it was like eagle's feathers. That's when he went crazy. Next, Esau is a hunter. In Genesis 25, 27, it says, And the boys grew, and Esau was a cunning hunter, a man of the field. And Jacob was a plain man dwelling in tents. Well, Nimrod was a mighty hunter, and he's a type of the Antichrist as well, really bad dude. Uh, many evil people in the Bible are hunters. Consider the adulteress who catches men. In Proverbs seven twelve through 13, Now is she without, now in the streets, and lieth in wait at every corner. So she caught him, and kissed him, and with an impudent face said unto him, So she's a hunter. She catches men. Now I'm not saying if you hunt and, and stuff you're, you're bad or something. It's just, that's just the way it is in the Bible. Usually when it talks about somebody that's a hunter, they're not usually good people. In Proverbs six twenty six, for by means of a horse woman, a man is brought to a piece of bread, and the adulteress will hunt for the precious life. In Micah seven two, 
It says, The good man is perished out of the earth, and there is none upright among men. They all lie and wait for blood. They hunt every man his brother with a net. Jeremiah 5.26, For among my people are found wicked men. They lay wait as he that setteth snares. They set a trap. They catch men. What's the Antichrist going to be doing? Catching men. He's going to have men running from him. He's going to be catching men, killing them, beheading them. So, he saw he's a type of the Antichrist. But it says in Genesis 25, 24, And when her days to be delivered were fulfilled, behold, there were twins in her womb, and the first came out red, all over like an hairy garment, and they called his name Esau. And after that came his brother out, and his hand took hold on Esau's heel, and his, and his name was called Jacob. And Jacob was threescore years old, and Isaac was threescore years old when she bare them. So he was already sixty years old. But Jacob means supplanter. He's a trickster, a deceiver, a schemer. He's someone that schemes to get his way. Uh, even at birth, when he took hold on Esau's heel, he's he's trying to get his way, trying to scheme and figure out a way so that he can be first. He wants to be born first. I mean, this sets the the tone and pattern for Jacob and Esau's life. This is why Jacob is called supplanter. He wants to take the place of him and be the firstborn. Uh, in Genesis twenty five twenty eight, and Isaac loved Esau because he did eat of his venison, but Rebekah loved Jacob. So Dad loves Esau. And Rebecca loves Jacob. I mean, this makes sense. Esau is the hairy, hunting, manly man's man. Uh, Jacob is a plain man who likes to stay inside. He's more soft. He's more of a, a mama's boy. Uh, however, parents should try their best not to choose a favorite. And they should treat the kids the same. As hard as that may be for some people. You should treat them the same. Love them the same. It says in Genesis twenty-five twenty-nine. And Jacob sawed pottage, and Esau came from the field, and he was faint. That's just like the flesh. It gets faint. But Jacob sawed pottage. He was cooking up some good chili here. I mean, he probably had some Fritos and jalapenos and sour cream and shredded cheese ready to go. Uh, but notice that Esau came from the field. In Matthew thirteen thirty-eight, it says, The field is the world. Notice how I told you that Esau, not only is he, a, is he a type of the flesh, a type of the Antichrist, he's also a picture of a worldly Christian. So the field is a picture of the world. So Esau is a picture of a worldly saint. He's coming from the field and he's faint. You see, when a Christian gets out in the world, you know what's going to happen to him? He's going to be faint. In Galatians 6, 8, and 9, it says, For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption but he that soweth to the spirit shall of the spirit reap life everlasting and let us not be weary in well doing for in due season we shall reap if we faint not but see if you get out in the world you are going to faint but we will reap good things if we faint not the devil wants to wear out the saints the devil is restless, you see. He runs to and fro, and he'll wear out the saints. As it talks about in Daniel 7, 25, talking about the Antichrist, he's going to wear out the saints. In Genesis twenty five thirty, and Esau said to Jacob, Feed me, I pray thee, with that same red pottage, for I am faint. Therefore was his name called Edom. You see, Esau seen that, and he said, Feed me. But Genesis twenty five thirty one and Jacob said, Sell me this day thy birthright. So he's like, If you're going to eat some of my chili here, give me your birthright. You see, he's scheming. So notice Jacob, the supplanter. He's scheming, trying to trick Esau out of his birthright. But Jacob pictures a faithless saint who just cannot wait on God. Because, you see, the promise was that the elder shall serve the younger. That was the promise way back when they were born was that the elders going to serve the younger. It was already said 
that Esau was going to serve Jacob. Yet he can't wait on God. He's already trying to get the birthright himself. And Jacob would have even saw the pattern with Isaac, his father, and Ishmael. But he can't wait on God. He's taking matters into his own hands. He already heard how the elder shall serve the younger. Genesis 25, 32, And Esau said, Behold, I am at the point to die. And what profit shall this birthright do to me? Esau's being a bit of a baby here. He's saying he's at the point to die. He's thinking very worldly, just like a worldly saint would. He's thinking, uh, what good is this birthright going to do for me if I'm just going to die right now? Which he probably really isn't going to die at the moment. But worldly people just don't think straight. But that's, that birthright that he's about to trade here has to do with an inheritance. And it talks about this again in Hebrews twelve sixteen. It says, Lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. Esau pictures a worldly saint who chooses the temporary things of the world and its temporary pleasures and wants to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. They choose all those things over the inter eternal inheritance that a faithful saint gets from God. So sin and living for the world won't cause you to lose salvation, but it will cause you to lose rewards and inheritance. Now I'm going to name you a list of sins, and when you do these types of things, you are doing what Esau did. You're, it's like you're trading in your birthright. You're selling your birthright for some temporary chili. And it probably doesn't even taste all that great. In Galatians five nineteen through 21, Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. You are wasting away your inheritance. You are selling your birthright. You're not going to lose your salvation, but you're missing. You're going to miss out on a lot of stuff you would have got. Genesis twenty-five thirty-three through thirty-four. And Jacob said, "Swear to me this day." And he swore to him, and he sold his birthright unto Jacob. Jacob schemed. He got exactly what he wanted. He's a trickster, a schemer, a supplanter. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and pottage of lentils, and he did eat and drink and rose up and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. Esau rose up and went his way, just like the flesh wants to do. He never would go the Lord's way. He despises his birthright.